Happy Friday the 13th, and welcome to The King in Giallo. I'm Tanner Leeser, and for this special video, I decided to begin something new. If you are new to this channel, I cover Giallo films with overviews detailing some behind-the-scenes facts surrounding the productions, and delve much deeper into some films by giving comprehensive breakdowns and reviews of their plots while tallying up the common cliches of the genre I observe within each film. If you are unfamiliar with what a giallo film is, I have some other videos covering this topic, but in short, it is an Italian film genre, much like spaghetti westerns, which began in the 1960s, boomed in the 1970s, and fizzled out in the 1980s, setting the stage for the slasher genre of America. Giallo films are usually mysteries which could contain elements of thrillers, suspense films, detective stories, horror, slasher, and to a lesser degree, the supernatural. The usual giallo is a murder mystery where you do not know the identity of the killer, who is as oftentimes a female as they are male. Giallo's influence on slasher is absolute, yet not entirely responsible for them. For the slashers which dominated in the 1980s, the giallo genre had already come and gone, and many of these films could be viewed as early slashers. Think of slashers and gialli, the plural of giallo, as cousins in the cinematic family of horror. They have a lot of the same genre grandparents, but they have different genre parents. Giallo is the strange artistic cousin who went to college first, Slasher is the cousin who did sports and was known by a larger body of people. I digress. I thought it would be fun to take a look at the first true formulaic slasher and count how many of the giallo cliches it contains. Sean Cunningham's 1980 Friday the 13th. Let me preface this by saying that, of course, I know that Friday the 13th is not a giallo, and in Cunningham's own words, he was trying to cash in on the success of 1979's Halloween by John Carpenter, but regardless, the film does share a lot of similarities with the Italian genre, and I thought for this Friday the 13th we could take a detour from the regularly posted content of my channel. If you are new here, please consider subscribing to The King in Giallo. I have new content almost every week and I'm making it my mission here on YouTube to give you the best coverage of this mostly dead genre. Friday the 13th was directed by Sean S. Cunningham in 1980 and written by Victor Miller. The music is composed by Harry Manfredini. Special effects are created by Tom Savini. It stars Betsy Palmer, Adrian King, Harry Crosby, Lori Bartnam, Mark Nelson, Janine Taylor, Robbie Morgan, and Kevin Bacon. The plot follows a bunch of young summer camp counselors arriving at Camp Crystal Lake, preparing to get it ready for kid campers to start showing up in the near future. The camp has the grisly nickname of Camp Blood due to a series of horrific unsolved murders which occurred there decades ago, plus the drowning of one of the campers. Despite being warned not to return to the camp, the counselors show up and begin in their duties, but a new spree of murders begins. For the more savvy horror cinephiles, let me say, as with determining the first true giallo is not so cut and dry as it may seem, the same is true for slashers. There have been numerous films in history that focused on murders, such as M, Psycho, and Twisted Nerve, just to name a few. And in the 1970s, we received the grindhouse masterpiece, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre by Toby Hooper, and that same year, Black Christmas by Bob Bob Clark, director of A Christmas Story. And while most fans regard Halloween as the first true slasher in 1979, this is true. But you would not be wrong if you were to also say Friday the 13th is also the first slasher that following year. Might not make perfect sense, but let me explain. I compare this to Giallo cinema with the early contributions by Mario Bava in the 1960s being the first Giallo films, but Dario Argento's The Bird with the Crystal Plumage in 1970 being the first true giallo to establish what the genre would be henceforth, while simultaneously setting the trend in motion. It's not as easy as black and white as that, but if Halloween is the final proto-slasher, Friday the 13th is the first true slasher, the one to establish the formula for the genre. I don't have time to truly get into this, but that's kind of how I see it. Let me also say that despite having a lot of similarities to the giallo film by Mario Bava, Bay of Blood, Friday the 13th is actually not inspired by that film in any way. Like I said, Sean Cunningham said that he was actually just inspired by Halloween and trying to make a money grab. I digress. 
Let's segue to the review and jelly tally portion of the video now. If you are new here, just know that there exists an A to Z of jello film cliches, plus I made my own list of cliches within the genre. You can watch that video on my channel, but I will point out these cliches in the film as they are observed. I usually begin my cliche tallying by looking at some things before starting the film, and since Friday the 13th is not actually a jello, I will gloss over most of these irrelevant sections. I will, though, start with the cliché title points and generously look at the title, Friday the 13th, to see if there are any giallo title clichés to award, and son of a bitch there are. Numbers in the title, five points. Well, let's start the movie. Well, damn, I need a sweater because we have a cold open. The movie just starts, five points. The film opens on the moon and then a description of the time and place. Camp Crystal Lake, 1958. We go into a cabin where we see a group of camp counselors singing along to a guitar. First person POV, five points. The camera walks into a cabin and we hear the first glimpse of the iconic sound design from Harry Manfredini. The camera skulks about spying on the children as they sleep. C is for children, five points. The song finishes, and two of our counselors leave without any subtlety or grace in order to go bump uglies. Kinda rude, guys. The couple enters a cabin, goes upstairs, and sets a blanket or something down on the floor for them to be on. This way you know they're not animals. Necking, five points. The camera tracks upstairs and catches our two lovebirds dry humping. V is for voyeur, five points. They separate and try to explain themselves. The killer's identity is hidden from the audience due to framing. Two points. Down goes the fella. After some cat and mouse, the lassie is off-screened to death. Z is for Zoom. Five points. We receive our title card, and I gotta say, this franchise has some great title bumps. We get some opening credits, and then the film opens on a small town on June, Friday the 13th, in the present if that was 50 years ago. We follow a young woman as she backpacks into town before stopping to ask a local for directions. The script reveals she is headed to Camp Crystal Lake. Anybody surprised? She enters a local establishment and asks the same question. Suspicious. What is it, Anus? Anus? He agrees to give our young lady a lift. Her name is Annie, by the way. Our friendly driver sort of hits on her before Ralph barges in to warn her of Camp Blood and its death curse. One day, when I look at slashers, this will be the Herald cliche. But for now, superstitious yokels. Two points. She didn't ask for help getting in, but Enos is more than happy to offer it. Hands off, dude. In the truck, we learn a lot about the history of the camp. Exposition dumping. Two points. He warns her off, then tells her about the murder, the drowning, and some fires. The camp has been unable to open since the 50s. He tells her that her boss has invested more than $20,000 into the camp's reopening. They agree to disagree about the state of the camp's curse. He drops her off and wishes her the best. We meet a few more of our prospective counselors clearly a bag of raging hormones. The group pulls onto the campgrounds and meets Mr. Christie as he chops wood. F is for fashion, am I right? Five points. This is Alice. Camp will be open in two weeks. Mr. Christie remarks about a portrait she drew of him last night. Art, five points. We find out that Alice and Steve, or Mr. Christie, are sort of an item. Let me just say, I find it interesting that in Slashers, the survivor girl is always made out to be a virgin and one who usually abstains from drugs and alcohol. But in the first few movies, this is not the case. Laurie Strode in Halloween is a virgin, but she's smoked a ganja. Alice here is not a virgin. I don't have issues with this. I just find it interesting that the first Slashers don't fall neatly into the mold of typical slasher cliches. Also, while I'm on this topic, the whole cliche of the black characters dying first is not a thing in the Friday the 13th franchise, and they are practically always portrayed as standing their ground and fighting back against the killer, whereas most of the other characters just run away or are killed outright. Something to think about. I love this franchise, but I digress. Alice says she has a lot on her mind and may be heading back to California, but Mr. Christie urges her to stay at least another week, which she agrees to. We get some more POV type shots at the campgrounds, but in this instance, it's unclear if it's meant to be someone watching or just a stylistic filming choice. Before leaving, Mr. Christie reminds them to stay on schedule, then warns them that some gnarly rain is on the forecast. Ta-da! 
That is neither professional nor safe. Meanwhile, Annie hitches a ride. The driver skips the turn, and the soundtrack immediately suggests doom. Reckless driving, five points. Annie jumps from the speeding vehicle. Nice tuck and roll. Annie runs into the woods as the driver gives chase. Foot chase, five points. It doesn't take long on that ankle for the killer to catch up to Annie and corner her. K is for knife, five points. Gorgeous work from Tom Savini. Add an extra five points for the knife kill. Back at camp, our counselors launch a boat, or barge, I guess. The kids are not alone as someone watches them from the tree line. Suddenly, something happens to Ned in the water. The team wrestles a boat into the water, which ultimately wasn't used. Alice throws a life preserver, which ultimately wasn't used. They begin CPR, but it was all for attention. Bravo, buddy. Bravo. Later, in Alice's cabin, she finds a snake. Animal featured. Two points, but just wait. Y is for yelling. <coughs> Extra points for a hysterical woman yell. Ten points total. The team convenes inside to help capture and kill the snake. Trigger warning. This is not a prop snake. They find and hack the snake up. Animal mutilated and animal killed. Three plus five, eight points total. Local law enforcement arrives just as... <coughs> X is for xenophobia. Five points. Uh, maybe not exactly xenophobia, but I'm feeling generous right now. Don't touch my bike. Do you have any idea how much I paid to get that police decal installed? He asks if they're smoking weed. Colombian gold, man. Colombian gold. That's a new one for me. He informs them that he's looking for Ralph, the town crazy. I told you to sit on it, Tonto. Yeah, I made the right call. Is he fucking stupid? The officer is called back and warns them to abstain from any tomfoolery. I love how the budget pretends that the hazard lights could ever simulate police cherries. <laughs> On one hand, you could just pretend that the town is just that poor, that they can't afford a real police bike. So, Crazy Ralph is on the loose. Wonder where he could be exact- OH MY GOD! So like, he was just waiting in there for what, 40 minutes or something? He proclaims to be a messenger of God and warns them that they will all die if they stay. Someone is mentally impaired or senile. Two points. He leaves. Nobody noticed his bike. As it gets late, the team realizes that Annie isn't showing up. They fix up the generator and prepare for nightfall. As two of our frisky counselors take off, Ned notices someone inside a cabin and goes in to investigate. Our two lovebirds have a brief conversation, then seek refuge from the impending storm. They get into a cabin and out of their clothes. The other counselors decide to play Strip Monopoly. Not sure exactly how that game works, but I don't think that's the point. Cut back to the duo. Aardvarking, 10 points. Honk, honk. N is for nudity. We see some side boob, five points. The camera pans up to reveal Ned dead from a throat slash. What is that, red stripe? Nah, you could do a lot worse, I suppose. Illicit drugs used, five points. The two finish up for the moment. Take five, everybody. The trio continues their game. Wait, why do they have the money out? So, is that part of the game? <laughs> Fuck it. Who cares? Back with the Baconator, we are about to witness the most iconic scene in the film. In my opinion, at least. And... BAM! <laughs> Marcy treks all the way to the facilities in the pouring rain. Now, she said she had to pee, but I don't think that was the whole truth. I'd say she's full of it, but won't be for long. hey -o! The killer walks in just as Tarantino takes over the filming for a moment. She gets out of the stalls, freshens up, then wises up to someone else being in the outhouse with her. She's cornered and takes an ax to the face. Bathroom murder set piece. Seven points. The game continues, but is interrupted by the storm outside. Brenda remembers she might have left the windows to her cabin open and says they will have to end the game here for the night. Seriously? We'll all go together with you and then just come back and resume the game. I think that's her convenient excuse because she's obviously losing. Whatever. She takes off barefoot, mind you. Back at the local diner, Mr. Christie is stormed in, but heads out regardless. I think he got that raincoat from Alice, sweet Alice. 
Hey, oh. 12 miles? Fuck me. Brenda enters the outhouse, brushes her teeth, and leaves, narrowly avoiding certain death. Meanwhile, Mr. Christie's truck has broken down. Faulty car or car trouble. Two points. He hitches a ride from local law enforcement. Brenda prepares for bed, then hears. She hears it again. She walks out into the rain and calls out. The screams for help continue. The screams sound like a small child. The killer flips on the floodlights and our friend here is off screened to death. Alice and, um, what's his name, reunite inside the cabin, then venture out to look for Brenda, who Alice swears she heard calling out. Inside her cabin, it is empty. They find a bloodied ax in one of the beds. They go to Jack and Marcy's cabin, which is also empty. They go to the outhouse, which is also empty. Alice becomes suspicious and says they should call for help. The two break into the office and try the phone, which is dead. T is for telephone, five points. The camera tracks over to reveal the line has been severed. They try to drive out, but the vehicle has been sabotaged. Alice suggests hiking out, but is told the journey will be 10 miles. I feel like I'd be this dumbass right now. I mean, hiking out 10 miles in a downpour sounds like hell. And I'd suggest just shacking up in a cabin until morning, honestly. Back in the car, the officer tells Mr. Christie about the increase of violent crimes during a full moon. He also warns him about Crazy Ralph showing up, but they picked him up and got him home. The officer is called out to a car accident, prompting him to drop off Mr. Christie. He arrives to camp rather quickly, it seems, then is met by someone hiding out behind the signpost who flashes a spotlight into his face. His lack of alarm at seeing who it is is rather telling if we had any characters we could actually suspect it to be. He gets impaled and we cut away. The kids are on their own now. Back at camp, the killer enters the shack with the generator, then we see all the power go out. Homeboy lights up some lanterns and tells Alice to get some sleep while he goes to check on the Jennies. Bill, I guess is homie's name. Sorry. He checks on the Jenny, which seems to be in need of gas. Or maybe it has gas? Bill! Jesus. Alice prepares some instant coffee. Jeez, you want some coffee with your sugar? Well, fuck the coffee, she says, and ventures out to look for Bill. I will say also that I don't think the characters are making dumb decisions right now per se. It's not like they know they're being stalked and killed. She finds Bill's raincoat, then Bill pinned to the door. Alice retreats to her cabin and wisely fastens the door shut, then barricades it. Better hope the killer doesn't break in through the window cause then you'd be effectively trapped in there. She equips herself with a bat and checks the cabin. She trades her lantern for a fork thing. I like her akimbo approach to self-defense here. She drops her guard for one moment, which is long enough for the killer to chuck Brenda's corpse through the window. She then breaks into hysterics, ditches her weapons, and flees about the cabin. Headlights appear outside. She struggles to remove her barricade, then rushes outside. The driver gets out, a middle-aged woman who introduces herself as Mrs. Voorhees, a friend of the Christie's. Alice falls into her arms and warns her of the deaths. Mrs. Voorhees is calm, cool, and collected. She tells Alice to get a grip and that she'll take a look. She finds Brenda's body, then laments the curse of Camp Blood. She begins to monologue to Alice about the drowning of the young boy, Jason, which occurred because the counselors were fooling around when they should have been watching him. After experiencing a flashback, she reveals to Alice that Jason was her son and today is his birthday. She confesses that she couldn't let them reopen the camp after what had happened. She continues to be stricken by the same flashback. Suddenly, Mrs. Voorhees begins to project onto Alice the negligence of the counselors 20 years ago. Alice grabs a weapon just as Mrs. Voorhees pounces towards her. Hidden identity of the killer until the final moments. Five points. O is for obsession, extra for it being the killer obsessed. 10 points. And S is for secrets, extra for the killer having a motivation which was impossible to predict. 10 points. Alice knocks her down, then runs from the cabin. Inside the car, she finds the dead body of Annie. She runs, but is stopped in her tracks by the dead body of Mr. Christie. She runs, just as Mrs. Voorhees stalks out of the cabin, then talks in her son's voice, commanding her, Kill her, mommy. Kill her. Alice enters a cabin filled to the teeth with rifles and scours for ammunition. Mrs. Voorhees fires up the generator, bathing the campgrounds in light. 
Mrs. Voorhees enters and tells Alice to give up. E is for eyeballs, five points. Alice pathetically attempts to keep Mrs. Voorhees at bay by tossing everything she can at her, to no avail. Mrs. Voorhees corners her, then bombards her with a barrage of slaps. Alice gets some lucky hits in and then darts the fuck out of there. Mrs. Voorhees gives chase once again, but slips right past Alice. Alice hides in a darkened cabin, then retreats inside a pantry closet. A light comes on in the cabin as Mrs. Voorhees searches for Alice. She seemingly goes out. Alice drops her guard again, allowing Mrs. Voorhees just enough time to capitalize. I'll generously give close up on a door handle. Five points. She rattles the handle, then hacks at the door. Alice arms herself with a pan. Mrs. Voorhees busts inside, machete in hand. The two duel for a moment, with Alice being the momentary victor. She foolishly drops her weapon and does not pick up the better weapon, but rather kicks over Mrs. Voorhees to see if she's alive or not. Again, this is a slasher cliche of failing to deliver a coup de grace or death blow. She sits by the water and just waits. Mrs. Voorhees, to no one's surprise, shows up, and the two fight it out once more. Alice gains the upper hand once again, and finally grabs the machete. She charges Mrs. Voorhees and cleaves her head clean off, revealing that Mrs. Voorhees was made of toothpicks all along. The killer is killed by someone. Ten points. Also, that she had some hairy meat handles. Victorious now, Alice hops into a boat and idles out into the lake. The following morning, Alice is still alive and the local police finally arrive on scene. We get a wonderful slow zoom on Alice before <laughs> one final jump scare. Alice awakens in a hospital. The police inform her that her parents are on their way up and that everybody at the scene is dead. She asks him about the boy who attacked her. Q is for questions, five points. They say they didn't find any boy. Alice remarks that he must still be there. The scene dissolves to one final view of the lake, then fades to black. Let's segue to the jelly tally cliches for this movie. Post jello viewing cliches. The reason for the killings. Revenge and psychological trauma, or mental illness, psychopathy, obsession. Both are worth the same amount, so seven points. The reason for the investigation. There is none. No points. Bonus points. The style bonus. Friday the 13th stylistically does not have a lot in common with Giallo films. There is a freeze effect, a fade to white effect, and a slow-mo, but no colored lights and no crash zooms or much of anything else indicative of the Giallo genre. There are POV shots up the ass, but in truth, POVs are found in plenty of horror films before Giallo even came along, and their use here is really the main tie to the styles of the genre, but POVs will also be a cliche for slashers in general. For the style bonus, I'll give the film 12 out of 25 points, mainly for all the use of POV shots. Soundtrack. No. This is a straight up horror soundtrack and a damn good one at that. No points. Bad effects. Nope. The effects are actually quite astounding. No points. Final look. Extra points. The Deadpool tallying how many kills and deaths are featured in the film. I break it down as thus, 10 points per kill or death scene for the main Deadpool, plus any stylistic kill multipliers, which we didn't add just yet, plus the knife kill bonuses, which I did already add. Keep in mind, there are numerous deaths which we do not see the actual kill of, but based on the wounds, I can just extrapolate how they likely were killed. Deadpool, first guy, Barry, impaled, 16 points total, first girl, Claudette, unknown cause of death, 10 points. Annie, throat slit, 17 points total. Ned, throat slit, 17 points total. Jack, impaled, 16 points total. Marcy, bludgeoned, 15 points total. Mr. Christie, impaled, 16 points total. Bill, throat slit. Stop for a moment here. Extra five points for E is for eyeballs for the eye mutilated. Separate points here also for a mutilation, in this case of eyes, another five points. For the kill points though, this is a total of 17 points for the throat slit. Brenda, 
10 points. Mrs. Voorhees, decapitation, 20 points total. Jason, drowned, 14 points total. Extended Deadpool for those other deaths mentioned but not seen, I give three points for each, and we don't have any deaths which qualify here. I count Jason's death in the main Deadpool because we see him about to drown. So, if we didn't get the flashback, it would be only three points. Red herrings for the total number of legitimate suspects in the film. Five points per legit suspect are awarded. Honestly, only one. Crazy Ralph, five points. Flashback sequences. We get this one flashback which we cut to a couple times. Five points. Nudity. For each instance, I award five points for ass, seven for breasts, and ten for genitalia. And we do see breasts. Seven points there. Ladies and gentlemen, for Friday the 13th, I awarded the film an A to Z score of 13 out of 26. How about that? With the bonus points for these, we have a modified score total of 95 points. And for the full Gialli Tally score, I award Friday the 13th a Gialli Tally score of 401 points. Not too shabby. If we compare that score with the Giallo films in the standing so far, we have The Girl Who Knew Too Much with 452, Blood and Black Lace in second with 422, Libido in third with 407, Friday the 13th would be in fourth, dethroning Death Laid an Egg with 372 points, and then way ahead of The Possessed in sixth with 328, and then The Telephone in last with 254. But it is not a giallo. So for those of you who may be annoyed if I do include it in the standings, Fear not, this was all just for fun, and Friday the 13th score will only reflect the Jolly Tally standings when we want to just joke around, but I will not include it within the true standings in the future. As I always say, these points don't mean a movie is better or worse. Thank you for humoring me on this experimental video for a non giallo film being treated as one. I will make more of these in the future just for fun, but it will mostly be a rare thing I do. Please like this video, share it with your friends if they are horror fans or cinephiles, subscribe to The King in Jello if you haven't yet, and if you have any questions, thoughts, curiosities, or concerns, leave those below in the comments section and I will get back to you. Give The King in Jello a follow on Instagram and a like on Facebook. What are your thoughts on Friday the 13th? Do you like this franchise? Uh, do you consider it to have qualities of giallo? I know this is obviously a very different genre and it's not a giallo, but you know, there were a few similarities and it did really well in the cliches. So that was interesting. If you're a fan of Friday the 13th, what is your favorite movie? I can tell you that even though I admit Friday the 13th is not the best opening slasher film for a franchise, the better ones being The Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Halloween and arguably Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the 13th is my favorite slasher franchise though. I think the first seven movies are a whole lot of fun and in my personal opinion, I think the Friday franchise is more solid than the Halloween franchise and the Texas Chainsaw franchise, arguably Nightmare franchise is up there, but this is just my personal taste. I really like these camp movies. For me, there's a nostalgic factor of when I was a kid and Halloween was right around the corner and trick-or-treating, and they would be playing marathons of Friday the 13th. So for me, Friday the 13th just has that nostalgic appeal. Again, these are slashers, and I... <laughs> I'm sorry to say I don't really regard slashers as great films. I regard them as fun films, but those are my thoughts. What are yours? Upcoming content for The King in Giallo will be Episode 8 of the Forgotten Giallo film series, 1968 Part 2, plus more special videos for October and Halloween. By November, I will return with an overview, review, and Gialli tally for the 1969 Paroto Giallo Orgasmo. Thank you all very much for your continued support here. This is Tanner Leeser for The King in Giallo, and if nothing else, I hope to see you next time. Well, there's no crazy people around here, right? <laughs>